I'm going to make this extremely exciting and fun uh, because that's what I'm here to do. I'm sure you guys have been talking business for the past couple of hours and you'll do that going forward as well. Um, but I'll just try and bring some fun into it. Okay. So by the time I'm gone, uh, right now all of you who are doing a business in a Web 2 world, I can't promise to take you into Web 3, but probably I'll, I'll leave you somewhere Web 2.5 by the time I'm gone. Um, so yes, I think let me start with an introduction to myself. So as Dinesh kindly mentioned, um, my name is Omer. Um, I've got almost two decades of experience, um, largely as a marketer. The first 18 years of them being an employee, um, exciting. But now when I compare that to the last two years of my life, it's been a roller coaster as an entrepreneur. Um, so I'll tell you what I did first. I've, I've largely been a marketer all my life. I started with media and entertainment, sports broadcasting, entertainment broadcasting. Um, then I moved into financial services and banking as a marketer. That's where I actually ended up meeting the Gargash Group, uh, who were my last employers before I left. So my last position was as the chief marketing officer for the Gargash Group. All of you know about Gargash, I think. Uh, you know, so, um, so yeah, and they were then my seed investors who seeded Michael. And today Michael is where it is. Um, so yeah, I'll quickly take you first a brief intro into Michael and then I'll come into the fun stuff. Um, so yes, so Michael is um, probably the only uh, working Web3 platform in the world today. Um, and, um, you know, we are driven by a vision to be a decentralized streaming platform. Um, and again, this ties back to my background because I've been into media and entertainment, as I mentioned. Um, and I've been a marketer, I've done a lot of content. So I always saw that there is a disbalance, right? And the disbalance is with the viewer, right? Because I believe that just like creators in a content economy are important, just like producers are important, just like streamers are important, viewers are also extremely important, right? So do you think any content creator in this world can be successful if viewers stop watching? So what's the most powerful thing within the content economy? What you as an ad, anyone here from marketing? So what do you pay when you advertise, let's say on YouTube, right? Or on Facebook, what are you paying for? Are you paying for the content? You're paying for the eyeball. Who does the eyeball belong to? Who owns the eye? The viewer, right? So now we're living in that generation where every young child you speak to, I've got two on my own, uh, they'll be like, you know, you ask them what they want to do in life, 70% of them are like, we want to be TikTokers and YouTubers and content creators. That's true, right? So my question, which I always ask is, imagine five years fast forward, everyone becomes a creator. Who's going to watch content? And this is driven, the fact that everyone today wants to be a creator is driven by the monetization, right? And the monetization is largely coming, 80% of the monetization in the content economy, by the way, is coming through advertisers. And the advertisers are paying for the eyeball. Who does the eyeball belong to? The viewer, right? So I have been trying to create something for the past two years, which actually brings power to the people that matter, who are the people who watch the content. And just creating a circular economy whereby a percentage of all advertising revenues actually go back to the viewers, right? Um, and that's what Michael is in very simple terms. In terms of numbers, we've come a very long way in two years, uh, largely driven by the fact that, you know, I've had investors, people, community, a very strong global Web3 community of people who believed in me and now my team. Um, so we have more than 2 million active users today. We've got more than 200,000 videos on the platform, which, is, which are published by users like yourself. We've got more than 600 popular influencers on the platform who are uploading content every day. We've done more than 300 live matches till now in different sports, including uh, cricket, um, paddle tennis, uh, kabaddi. Um, cricket is obviously the largest. Um, we've started doing a new sport, which we're the first ones actually to feature. It's called backgammon, which is a game, you know, it's something similar to poker. Uh, but again, it ties in really well with the philosophy of bringing power to the viewers. Um, we funded more than 50 originals till now using our Web3 community, uh, this decentralized economy that we have. Um, 
and we've done more than $4 million of revenue. Um, so yeah, things are great. And that's what Myco is, but we're not here to talk Myco. We're here to talk Web3. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I keep, keep giving you these examples of Myco in the middle so that you understand how you can connect Web3 to your business and take advantage of this technology that exists today, right? Um, so yeah, this is obviously, this is our vision, our motto, a brand tagline to bring power to the viewers. And that's what we're doing. Um, so let's talk jargons first, right? Uh, the terms that you've heard, uh, starting with, which is the you know one that's listed on the agenda as well, which is Web3, right? So what is Web3? That's the first question, right? Anyone wants to take a grab at that? OK, interesting. We're getting there. Anything simple which everyone can understand? That's true. Okay. Any simple explanation I'm looking for? All of you are correct, by the way, but you know, I'm looking for a very simple explanation that anyone and everyone, including in the room, including our friend who's filming me right now, can understand. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. So, how I like to define Web3 is you can read what's written, but, but largely, He's right, three-dimensional, but what are those three-dimensional? So web one was communication only, right? Which means that you could communicate only from a platform to a user, right? Web two was communicate plus publish. Communication plus publishing, which means that now you could also interact, you could give your comments using social media, you could reach out to the website of Showmart and say that I didn't like the product, so now you had an option to actually go back. Um, you can do user-generated content, you can go publish stuff on the YouTube um, or on Facebook, so that's two ways. That's communication plus publishing, right? And Web3 is communication plus publishing plus ownership, which means that I will communicate, I will get the communication, I will be able to respond back, but at the same time I can actually own the communication, I can own my data. Right? and using the blockchain technology. I'll, I'll dive deeper into that, but I, I'm the kind of person who always wants to talk about the bad side as well, right? So the Web3 is great, and you'll understand in the, you know, in the subsequent discussion how powerful it is. But the problem with Web3, which is why I'm so excited to be here, is that you know, people from the Web2 space are not focusing enough on Web3, and that's why the the solutions like Myco, which I came up with because I'm a web one, web two guy, right? Um, solutions which are gonna drive adoption into web three, which are gonna bring the next billion users is not there, right? And, and the problem I can define in a very simple way um, that web one and web two businesses are B2B and B2C. You know what B2B, B2C is, right? What is it? Business to business, business to consumer, right? Whereas Web3 till date today, other than a few exceptions like Myco, is B2G. Anyone knows what the G is? What's the G? It's something funny, I can give you that clue. What's the B2G? It's business to geeks. You know geeks, right? And there's another G, by the way, in there, which is business to gamblers, <laughs> right? So that is the problem for Web3, that brands like yourselves are not utilizing the technology to utilize your wealth of experience, your years of experience, and understanding the consumer to create products which a consumer can use, right? So Web3 will be successful when it becomes B2C. Right now, it is only targeting the geeks and the gamblers, the gamblers want to make money, become rich. The geeks, because they understand, right? Um, and that's where adoption comes in. That's where people like yourselves come in. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the discussion, I can inspire some of you to think about some exciting ideas which can target the consumers and not the geeks. Um, so what is the blockchain? Anyone wants to take a shot at that?
Amazing, amazing. So yeah, the blockchain is basically the technology layer under the Web3, right? So how do you enable Web3? You enable Web3 using the blockchain. And the blockchain essentially, it's a distributed ledger for information, communications, and transactions, and now even economic flow um, that is owned by no one, which means that it is completely decentralized. And as he said, it's traceable. It's completely traceable. It's completely transparent. Um, but the real deal is that it is distributed and decentralized, right? Um, everyone who is contributing to that blockchain is an equal owner. This one is exciting. What's the metaverse? Yeah, it, I, I heard, a, I, read a, I read an article saying it's dead. And then three days later, Apple launched something which was pretty exciting. So yeah, what is the metaverse? I should have brought some of our devices, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, people confuse the metaverse for those devices, right? Which means that now Apple and Facebook are all, you know, obviously fighting with each other to have the latest technology. But it's not the hardware. Do you think it's the hardware? No. Why? It's a space. It's a virtual world. Very good. Anything else? Yeah, I'm going to come to those examples, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 12 hours, yeah. OK, so how I would like to define the metaverse is that the, meta the metaverse is potentially an iteration of the internet, is a new form of the internet, um, which is a single universal and immersive virtual world that is facilitated by the use of technologies like virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality, right? And mixed reality, you all saw what Apple did. You know, that's the perfect example of mixed reality. Uh, but on the hardware side, again, I feel that the hardware is going to evolve. Over the next three years, the hardware is going to evolve tremendously. What the metaverse will be could potentially just be a lens in your eye. It could just be a pin in your ear. And it's all mixed. So you're part of this world. And at the same time, you're also part of this virtual world where you can do a lot. Um, and when you combine all of these jargons, what is it that the Web3 is trying to create? I think that's what we all need to understand. What is it that the Web3 is trying to create, right? And so this um, is like my vision of Web3. I haven't copied it from anywhere. You know, I just wrote it myself, and I always use this. Um, but I think this is extremely powerful. So what we're trying to create is a world where borderless consumption of products and services can happen in a convenient, superior virtual environment that will be open for all and can be exploitable by none, right? And that's where the transparency and everything comes in. Make sense? OK, so now let's talk about my favorite term, which is decentralization. What is decentralization? Um, it, you know, and I'm, I'm asking from um, philosophical perspective, what do you think is decentralization? What's the concept of decentralization in the world that we live in philosophically? Amazing. Um, anyone else? Yeah. But do you think, OK, let me ask you this. Do you think decentralization happens at once? It's a progression, right? Have we always seen decentralization around us? I believe that every disruption that has happened in mankind, in this world, has always been driven by some form of decentralization, right? So let's say we go back to the time when Facebook and Instagram and YouTube allowed you as a user or an influencer to start publishing content to thousands and millions of people. Did Facebook ask these guys to submit a production degree or a journalism degree, you know? No, right? So there was a move from only the platforms being able to publish content to now anyone being able to publish content. That was decentralization, right? Similarly, if you talk about retail and e-commerce, um, you created e-commerce platforms. You created loyalty programs where now the user could actually interact back with you, right? They could buy products off you. They could earn reward points. Using those reward points, they could do something else, which they couldn't before. That was an element of decentralization, right? So it's a movement. It's happening. 
there was decentralization from web zero to web one, and then from web one to web two, there was decentralization, and now there is going to be decentralization, which is more decentralization from web two to web three, right? Um, and I think now the most important thing to understand is that decentralization is driven by two things. One is technology, and the other is the people, right? Because the technology facilitates more and more decentralization, but it is the human behavior, the consumer behavior that evolves because people change, right? So the Gen Z that I'm talking about, which I'm trying to build for, they think completely differently than the previous generations. Their expectation of power is much more than before, right? Um, now they don't just want access to data. They just don't want access to be able to interact. They actually want ownership. They want to be part of the community. They want to get economic benefits, right? Um, and that's how decentralization is going to evolve with time using the changing consumer behavior and at the base of it is the technology that changes, right? So again, just to explain how decentralization has moved, again, I'll give you an example from the content business because that's the one that I do, but you can now apply the same science into everything and you'll see that this is how decentralization moves, right? So within our business, um, there used to be a time when there was a producer's economy, right? Which means that if the content was good, everyone would be sitting at 8 p.m on a Sunday waiting for that episode, right, in front of a television screen uh, because the content was good. At that time, the user did not have any power. They didn't even have the power to decide when to watch the thing that I like or where to watch the thing that I like. I, if it's in cinema, I have to be in cinema. If it's at 8 p.m. on TV on a Sunday, I have to leave everything else and sit in front of it. But then, you know, the people changed and people like, this doesn't work. And then there were companies like Netflix or YouTube or Amazon that realized that this need was there and they came and created a technology which had some form of decentralization which said, okay, let's give them the flexibility to watch what they want at a time of their choice. The viewer thought, I'm getting more power. That's the reason why Netflix became successful. It's not their technology. It's the fact that they gave more power to the user and the user wanted that power, right? And then the next phase of decentralization happened when um, you know platforms like social media platforms they allowed creators to get more power right who would have thought like five years ago that TikTok will actually be making more revenues than Netflix did you think about that TikTok is actually taking the economic share away from Netflix today why because TikTok came up and they're like okay we're gonna give more power now to the creator right so again that was decentralization it was not the technology, it was not the UI, UX, the interface, it was the decentralization, more power given to people, right? And now, within the Web3 environment, the decentralization needs to extend beyond, which means that the power should not only be with the people producing content, but also with the people watching content. So if I'm a user who watched, um, you know, what's this famous show on Netflix that became really popular, you know, the young kids who, you know, the other side, it was something about Stranger Things, right? So, 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 you know, when Stranger Things 1 came, and then Stranger Things 2 came, right? So my younger brother, he's like a, he's like a geek. Um, so, by the way, he worked in Landmark once upon a time. So, so he told me that this show is like so fabulous, it's going to become like a billion dollar thing, you know, in the future. And I was like, what is he talking about, right? He was like, if, if, just I had the opportunity to invest into sacred games, you know, I would become so rich. And that happened. Sacred Games 3 came and it became the most watched show in the world, right? Now imagine if my brother at that time when I was ignoring him, he had the opportunity to actually invest into Sacred Games 3 because he had watched it. He invested into stocks and bonds and other investments, you know, he invested into real estate. Why didn't he have an opportunity to invest into Sacred Games? Right? Um, so that's how decentralization moves. And similarly for all of you, let's say there is a product that Chumart is launching, which all of you believe in, right? And the consumer also believes in. Um, and, you know, the production cost 
needs to scale up by, let's say, 300% of what you are right now investing into the product. Now, as employees and consumers, could you ha actually have an opportunity to pick up that extra 300% so that you become stakeholders in that new launch? I think you could, right? Um, and that's how decentralization evolves. And it's coming, you know, it's coming faster than we think. That's the fun thing about technology, because you know, uh, technology and disruption, they come to us, we ignore it until this line, because there's no clear line, by the way. So between current technology and new technology, the line is always very blur, right? And there comes a time when you actually enter to the other side and you don't even realize it, right? Do you remember the time when Facebook was new and some of us, I mean, like I used to think like that, why would I make a friend on Facebook? Raise your hands if you thought like that, right? Right? Why would, I, why would I chat with someone on internet if I can speak to them in person, right? We thought like that. And then there came a time when they are on the phone, like 22 hours a day, chatting to people, not meeting them in person, even sitting with them in person and then chatting to someone else on the phone, right? So that's how blur it is. We move, we don't realize, then we stop using those terms. There was a time when people used to use the term, hey, internet, you know the internet came. Do you hear someone get excited about internet now? It's there, it's a part of us, right? Yeah. So similarly, similarly, so this technology, the blockchain, I feel that people are gonna stop using this term. People are gonna stop using the term Web3 and the metaverse because it will become a part of us, you know? And as I said, there will be a lens, I believe, I don't know whether Apple's gonna do it or Meta's gonna do it or Google's gonna do it, but there's gonna be a lens in your eye for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's actually interesting because I recently received an offer for a buyout of my company from an Israeli group. So, so yeah, um, anyways, so coming back, yeah, I, I keep doing this marketing for you guys so that you remember what Myco is and all of you should download the app. Um, so why should you build in Web3, right? Um, now that's the next question. Okay, it's, this is all fun and stuff, but why should I build in Web3? If I'm a business, I'm doing pretty well. Why should I build in Web3? So I think one of the biggest consideration factors is that the Web3 does not come with the limitation of time and space. You can sell to anyone, anywhere in the world. You, can, you don't have to limit yourself in terms of time zones. You can operate 24, seven, right? Um, so I'll give you again an example from one of the things that we did, which I felt was really cool, was that, so we wanted to change the way cinema is done, right? So if you go into micro socials, you'll see that we launched something called the Cineverse last year, which was, basically our idea of utilizing this advantage of Web3. Because what happens today is that cinema is pretty much linear, right? Which means that you have to go to a cinema at a fixed time, follow a schedule. Uh, you can only be with the people who are there with you in the cinema, right? Now, what if I wanna go watch a movie? There's a, there's a new premiere. I wanna go watch it with my friend who's right now sitting in LA. Can the Web3 make that possible, right? Yes, because it's a cinema experience at the end of the day. What is cinema? It's an, it's an experience, right? So if you can create that experience around you using the technology, which means that you're sitting in your lounge, but you actually feel like you're sitting in cinema and you're getting the same film that just got released three days ago in the same quality, right? And then using avatars, I know this is crazy, but using avatars, I can sit with that friend of mine who's in LA right now, and I can feel that he's seated with me. And now with haptics technology, I mean like, not that I would hold his hand, but I can actually hold his hand while watching that film, right? And can the technology be integrated with something like a Web2 solution like Talabat, where I can actually order popcorn? I think I can, right? So. And yes, as crazy as it is, this is what the Web3 does. The Web3 takes away all the limitations of space and time, right? Um, 
Make sense? Convenience and interoperability, right? So why do you want to go to a store and shop if there is a technology that allows you to see an avatar or experience an avatar that looks exactly like you and you can go into the shoe mart store and you can actually try out that shoe within the Web3 environment and feel like you're wearing that shoe, right? Then why would you go, why would you spend like, you know, 20 minutes extra just to go into that mall, right? And I know we're not yet there, and I'm not telling you guys that we'll be there like next year. It's going to take time. But it is the convenience that is extremely important. And it, there is so much interoperability because you can go from one environment to the other environment, from the second environment to the fourth environment, and then back into the first environment in a matter of seconds. Um, this one is really important, which is the limitations of supply and demand. Right? So let me ask you something. Uh, in luxury, I know you guys are not into the luxury segment, but I'm sure some of you have worked for the luxury segment before. In luxury, right now, what's the biggest problem in any luxury good that you're talking about? Watches, cars, yachts, scarcity, right? There's more buyers than you have the product. The product is limited. Everyone wants to buy it. That's why there's that premium on the Rolex, you know? Um, so, but the Web3 solves all of that, right? And doesn't only solve that in the virtual experience, which is like, for example, what Ferrari did was that, you know, before they launched the physical car, they actually launched that experience, which people could have that entire experience, same quality within a game, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about using the Web3 technology to create shared experiences, right? So why do people buy luxury products? Okay, now. You, you all have to give honest answers, right? Today, if someone is buying a car worth a million dollars or a Rolex worth $100,000 or a Gucci bag worth, I don't know, $10,000, why do people do that? Okay, that's one. I need honest answers. Status, Status okay. Steam, so that, so that they can take that picture, cool picture on social media, right? That's one of the main reasons. You guys agree? The second is experience. Yes, you know, these luxury brands offer some really interesting experiences as well. But largely it is show off. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, I don't want to use that term, but you know, um, it is social media presence and being a part of a certain community, right? The good way of saying it is that they want to be a part of a certain community and that's why they buy that luxury experience. Um, and then they also want the experience. But do they want that experience every day? If you're wearing a Rolex, let's say you have, and I know such people that have got like 50 Rolexes in their, in their sitting in their cupboard. There's two reasons that we discussed, so that you know he can show off wearing each of these ones, um, and then be be seen with that. Same goes for the Ferrari or the Lamborghini. Now the point is that why can't those experiences be shared in a Web3 environment? Why can't you create a community, an exclusive community of 20 people who have 20 of the same product, different versions, rather than each of them going and having to buy all 20, because all 20 are not available for everyone, there's scarcity, they can actually share, right? As long as they belong to the same community, they feel they can be part of the same community, they're happy to share experiences with each other. Possible, right? Um, the last point, the, the other point is obviously current hardware versus future state. I've already discussed this, that we should never, when we're thinking of Web3 applications, we should never start thinking with the current hardware because otherwise we're going to be like, oh, the current hardware is so difficult, it's so boring, it's so bulky, it's so expensive. You don't build like that. You always build for the future state, right? And as I said, the future state is going to be super. You know, it's going to be so easy that it's going to be a part of our lives. So start building and start thinking for that from today. Similarly, the current environment, you know, right now you have most of the metaverse projects out there. You will see these, you know, ugly, freaky looking avatars in there. And you're like, I don't want to be them, right? But that's just an environment today. As I said, tomorrow, those avatars will look exactly like you. You know, you, you won't be able to differentiate between you and your avatar, right? Um, and that's, that's where you need to be thinking about what do I do as a brand? 
as a business, what do I do today to be able to cater to that when that change comes, right? Um, loyalty and subscription. It's like people, people ask this, you know, and again, this is a reality check for you guys because I know you have a great rea loyalty program under Landmark Group, is people think to themselves when they make those loyalty points, they're like, why should I spend? The new user thinks, why should I spend my loyalty points on buying their products again? That's the option they have, right? Do they have another option with those loyalty points? Right? Why can't, if I, let's say I've got like, there are like five tiers of loyalty and I'm at the highest tier of loyalty. Why can't I use my tier to contribute to the next product? You know, if I bought, a sh if I bought 500 shirts, let's say, that gives me enough loyalty points to qualify for me to play a role in the design of the next shirt that is launched or contribute to that design, bring some innovation into it, and then let people buy it. And if people buy it, maybe have a small 1% for me because I, I'm the one who came up with that idea. That's today's consumer. Today's consumer needs to be more informed, engaged, involved, not just in the consumption process, but also in the production process and in the e-commerce process, right? Um, Transparency and traceability, I think it's very simple. You, you've spoken about this, all of you understand um, that this is what Web3 brings, right? And just to, again, come back, give you an example on Michael. So how we distribute our advertising revenue between users and the, and the creators is that we do a 65-35, which means that 65% of the advertising revenue that gets generated, let's say on the niche content, the niche has a YouTube channel, let's assume it has got like 500K followers, it does. Um, and on the 500 followers, there is advertising. So let's say Schumart comes and advertise on his channel. What YouTube does is they will give 50% to the niche, keep 50% themselves. What we do is that we give 65% to the niche, the remaining 35 to the people watching the niche's content, right? Because we are a decentralized video streaming platform. We don't make any money of someone else's content. The content belongs to him, not me. I can only make money if the content is mine. And yes, 90, 80, 90% of the consumption on my platform right now is my own content or content that I've licensed or acquired or syndicated, which means I make the 65%. Um, but now imagine YouTube tomorrow sees what Michael is doing and YouTube announces that I'm going to give 10% of all my revenue to people. Will anyone believe that? Why? Because of the last point. Because there's no traceability. There's no transparency. They can claim all they want. But until and unless they're, they're built on the blockchain, how are they going to prove it, right? Whereas in my case, because I'm a Web3 business, my revenue first goes onto the blockchain, gets recorded, and then there's a BI tool which everyone can see and then gets redistributed based on the impressions that you deliver as audience members or as creators, right? So similarly, if Schumart wants to create a scheme where referral, you really want to give something away for referral and you want to give them a stake against referrals and loyalty, if you do it on the blockchain, people will believe you, right? And that's where then you will be able to scale that concept up. Yeah, you can create subscription models. So it can be subscription, it can be direct revenue. For example, in our case, it's advertising revenue. We've just fixed a share of that revenue that goes back to the user, but goes back through the blockchain, which everyone can see, right? So similarly, you can apply that onto your business. Um, but the most important thing, you know, above everything is the community. So all of these benefits that I said, why you should build into Web3 are probably just 5% of it. 95% of it is community, right? So, and again, I'll give a small example. When I started uh, Myco, it was at that time we called it M content and I basically took a two month leave from my bosses because I hadn't taken a leave for like three years and I was like, I'm going uh, and you know, I'll be putting myself in the room and I'm just trying something out. I didn't give them too many details. So in that room, I created this concept of Myco and then, you know, I started interacting with the global Web3 community. I started doing these Twitter spaces, Telegram chats. People used to come in, listen to me, wh what I'm doing. Um, and I didn't have a product. At that time, I didn't have any funding. Um, I didn't have any rich people in that community. It was just people who believed in what I was building. And when I did my pre-sale, which was June 2021, 20, uh, uh, 
I actually, in the first two and a half minutes, I raised a million dollars. Right? People sent a million dollars to my blockchain wallet just based on the belief that I'm building something which could be meaningful tomorrow, right? And that's the power of community, right? So as brands today, you are selling to the consumer, right? Try making them a part of your community and see how things are different, right? Um, so, so community is the strongest thing in Web3, which can never be there in Web1 or Web2. And that is driven by all the aspects that we've discussed. Yeah, this is the truth, then, right? Uh, and also, what community does then is that, you know, you can sell this picture for $100,000. This ugly ape. Anyone knows about this? Board Ape Yard Club, yeah. So, so this is what, yeah, yeah, right now it's at $100,000. You can, you can find a couple at that price. But crazy, right? You know, buying a picture of an ape for 100000 But are they buying a picture? They're buying that, no, no, they are buying, they're buying that membership into the community, you know, it's the most elite, it's the most uh, aspired, anyone who understands Web3, this, having this ape is your entry into the Board Ape Yard Club, which is the most inspired and the most elite Web3 community out there in the world. So, so yes, they've done it, the Yoga Labs guys, you know, the very smart, um, young, with five of them, you know, they built this super amazing community. Um, and it took them a few years to do this, obviously. But now let's say you want to create your community in Web3 to sell your product and be profitable, right? That's at the end of the day, they became profitable. Everyone wants to do something for the community to make the community profitable, but also be profitable themselves, right? So how do you create a profitable Web3 community? The first step is don't start by being profitable. <laughs> That's the first step. You know, if you try and create a community and the first thing you're thinking is, okay, I want to make profits, you will never make the profits and you will never make the community. That's the first tip. Um, the second tip is create exclusivity. Create convenience and ease, but create exclusivity. It cannot be for everyone, right? If it is for everyone, then it cannot be closely knitted. They will not believe in each other. They will not believe in you as a brand. So you need to create a barrier to entry into that community. Yes, the blockchain is transparent and the technology is available to everyone, but it needs to be linked to something. You know, I don't know, number of years of being a Shoemart customer, that loyalty, you know, number of transactions that they've done. Create something which gives exclusive access to a bunch of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, not your entire user base. Right? Um, create FOMO. Anyone knows what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. That's extremely important, you know? Uh, and again, people say that, oh, this is a Web3 term because, you know, creators are trying to sell their products at a premium. No, FOMO has always existed. Has it? Right? Why do you think, why do you think when uh, Lamborghini releases a new model, they're like, oh, we only have 20 in your country. You know, there's only 20 pieces in your country. That's FOMO. They're trying to create FOMO, right? Um, same goes with bags and watches and everything. So that's extremely important that create FOMO, but still do it with love. Don't do it in an arrogant way because in Web3, there's no such thing as being an arrogant brand. You know, you have to be down to earth, but create exclusivity and create FOMO at the same time. Um, this, I think, is very important, which is meet in the middle somewhere. Right? Uh, so if I create a community and uh, right now, let's say I'm Shumart and I want to work with Dinesh to create a Web3 community. And for the first two years, all the events that we are doing for that community are in the metaverse, in Roblox or in Sandbox. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Right? Which means that we have to meet in the middle right now. We are living in a not a Web3 world, we are living in a world which is Web2, moving towards Web3, which is somewhere Web2.5. So the community that I create also needs to be Web2.5. You know, the Board Ape Yard Club, they, they've got like two annual events a year. People fly from all over the world. They leave their birthdays, their children's birthdays, they leave their wife's birthdays, which is very tricky. And they, and they land in that place just to be with their community, you know, um, because there is 
physical, beyond digital, there is also that physical relationship and interaction that they create, right? So they meet in the middle, which is Web 2.5. That's what you also need to do if you decide to create a Web 3 community. Do actual events, you know? Make these people a part of those events. Let, give them opportunities to speak, express themselves, bring ideas on the table, be creative. Uh, you never know something that the community member actually comes up with could be your next Air Jordan, right? You know, the concept of Air Jordan, it came from someone in the team at that time, um, in Nike, who was not even in the PD team. You've heard the story, right? So, so you never know, you know? Create that community and something might come up. Um, sell, sell real problems, solve real problems. I think that's also extremely important. Um, yes, the apes and all are great, but as, as we said, there are so many gaps that the Web3 can solve. You know, gaps related to convenience, time and space, um, scalability, transparency, traceability. Find those gaps. Find those gaps in your business based on the feedback that you get from your consumers today. Is there any gap that you can use the Web3 technology to facilitate and then fill that gap? Right? And that's where your thought process should be. Um, and I think the most powerful ideas in Web3 are not even there yet, other than one. Uh, but the most powerful ideas are gonna come from those user gaps because you people have been serving those users, your consumers for the past decade. You've been working in the same industry. You know the ins and outs of what they're thinking, what they need, how they're evolving. Bring those insights, then mix that with the technology and what you're gonna build is going to be extremely powerful, successful, profitable Web3 products and very profitable Web3 communities. Give something to them. I don't know if it's revenue share or if it is, uh, something else, but find a way to make them stakeholders of your brand success in the future. Don't just sell them products. Make them a part of the community, then make them a, part, a stakeholder in your success, right? Um, and the last is, which is for me, you know, this is the highlight. Never take your consumer for granted, you know? So, and I did this, I'll show you a video, which is very interesting, you like it, and then we'll just fin shortly finish after, is that, um, I applied this thought that we cannot, as content people, we cannot take our consumers for granted, right? Because I felt that the creators and the platforms and the producers, all three of them are taking the viewer for granted, right? So we did this campaign earlier this year, which got us around 14 million uh, views on across socials. It's a beautiful campaign. It's all done in-house. We haven't spent a lot on it. Um, but the thought is that what we said was that since the platforms out there and the TikTokers and the YouTubers out there, they don't care about the viewer. There will be a day when the viewer is going to say, okay, I'm not in content anymore. I'm not watching content. I'll go and do something else. I will go play, play a game in the metaverse, which gives me that power. I'll do something else. So imagine there is a world without viewers. Can you think of a world where there is no viewer? So we did a thematic, just to explain this last point, I'm gonna play that video for you. And then you can think about all the iterations about your businesses, because then you start imagining a world without your user or your consumer, right? And why you need to give them more importance than you do today. So, right. so people were throwing burgers at each other uh, and it became like a huge success. Um, and if you scored a lot, you know, you were a leader in the game, then you would get free vouchers to actually go and get the free meal. Um, Again, really, really fun stuff. Ferrari, uh, I think I mentioned this, they launched the 296 GTB, first within the metaverse, and they let the players within Fortnite experience that completely before they even launched the actual product, right? And it was an amazing, incredible experience for whoever actually got to do that. Um, Balenciaga, they've been you know, selling, uh, basically, they had NFTs, so you could actually buy clothes or caps for your avatar, right? And it was all integrated in the way that you could actually experience your avatar wearing all of those things, right? And it was amazing, you know, as NFTs, they were sold extremely successful again. Um, uh, Ballman partnered up with Barbie uh, and they did like a collection, which was, I think, uh, only nine of them, you know, and they got sold out. Um, and then um, 
Dolce and Gabbana, they participated. They actually created like a metaverse fashion show. Uh, and, and again, I think their pieces got sold for $6 million or something, which was very few pieces. They also came with physical versions of the same, um, you know, designed uh, wear. And, and that version, that physical version was only available if you buy those NFTs, right? And that was the charm of it. Um, Louis Vuitton, I'm sure for all the ladies here, it's a favorite brand. <laughs> so, so they did like an entire game. They actually rolled out and then, you know, there was an NFT collection tied to it. Again, huge success. Tag her, they had like a watch, uh, you know, a smart watch where you could actually showcase your, your NFT. It got connected to your smartphone. Again, this was a huge success within the Web3 enthusiast. But I personally feel now, you know, brands like them, they need to do something for the Web2 user and not for the Web3 user. But again, this was a huge success, got them a lot of PR. And yeah, obviously I keep the last, the best one for the end. This was me, that's me. <laughs> so, so yeah, since I, you know, I'm still pretty much a part of the Gargash family, the Gargash group. So, uh, you know, so we did this um, NFT collection for the AMG GT Black because we only had like seven of these in Dubai and we had like a waiting list of 75. So, you know, I went up to our boss and I was like, you know, maybe we can do something around NFTs. So we created this NFT collection where for the next 36 months, you could actually have 36 owners. So 36 people could drive the car for a month like its own and then park it back, get refurbished, cleaned up and back again, right? And again, this was a huge success. Um, so because of that insight that you were talking about that you know, people just wanna show off. So you can show off in a month. Why do you need to show off for five years? <laughs> So, uh, and then same with uh, Burberry, you know, I think it was a very interesting collection that they launched in partnership with Mythical Games. Um, yep. So a few examples. Um, I would like to close with this. Uh, I want to leave the thought of um, just giving a small message that the Web3 technology was created not for the geeks to build for the geeks, but, to, but for real business people like yourselves to build for the real consumer, right? So, so start thinking about it, start exploring. Um, and yes, obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Dinesh and the team here, they have my contacts. Uh, feel free to email me at any time. I'd be happy to answer questions. Even if you have any questions right now, I don't know if that's part of the agenda, but if, yeah, maybe at lunch, okay. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you.